the sun new and tangry. While the nomads of Iranian stock, Scythians and Sarmatians occupied the western part of the steppe zone, the eastern part was under the sway of Turco-Mongol peoples. Of these, the dominant nation in antiquity was known to the Chinese by the name of Sungnu, a name cognate with that of Huns, Huni, and Hunao. According to the Chinese historian Su Ma Qian, it was in the second half of the 3rd century BC that the Sungnu seemed to have become a united, strong nation. They were led by a chief called the Shanyu, whose full title transcribed into Chinese is Qingli Kuta Shanyu, words which the Chinese translate as Majesty Son of Heaven. In these words may be detected Turco-Mongol roots, Qingli in particular is the transcription of the Turkic and Mongol word Tangri, Heaven. Under the Shanyu served two great dignitaries, the kings Tu Qi, that is to say, the wise kings of right and left, the Chinese transcription Tu Qi being related to the Turkish word Dogri, straight, faithful. In so far as one can speak of fixed dwellings for essentially nomadic people, the Shanyu resided on the upper Orkhan, in the mountainous region where later Karakoram, the capital of the Genghis Khanite Mongols, was to be established. Their religion was a vague shamanism based on the cult of Tangri or heaven and on the worship of certain sacred mountains. The Tuchu and Tangri In 572 the Byzantines themselves embarked on a war against Persia which was to last for twenty years. Meanwhile, the western Tuchu and the Byzantines maintained close relations. Envoys were exchanged. These various ambassadors enabled the Byzantines to acquire a fairly accurate idea of the customs and beliefs of the Tuchu. The Turks, Theophylactus Symacats tells us, hold fire in very extraordinary honor. Indeed, the influence of Iranian Mazdaism had caused them even to adopt the god Ormazd or Ahura Mazda. They venerate air and water also, and in effect among the Genghis Khanites, reverence for running water was carried to such lengths that Muslim ablutions and the washing of clothes were forbidden except under certain conditions. But it is the author of heaven and earth alone that they worship and call God, sacrificing to him horses, oxen, and sheep. Such indeed is the cult of Tangri, the heavens in their divine aspect, common to all the ancient Turco-Mongol peoples. Finally, what Theophylactus says of their priests who seem to them to foretell the future, applies to the Turco-Mongol shamans, who continued to exert great influence in the days of Genghis Khan. Cultigan's inscription at Koshot Sadam. When the blue sky above and the dark earth beneath were created, between them were created the sons of men. Above the sons of men arose my ancestors, Buman Kagan and Istami Kagan. When they had become masters, they governed and established the empire and the institutions of the Turkic people. At the four corners of the world, they had many enemies, but, making expeditions with armies, they subjugated and pacified many peoples at the four corners of the world. They made them bow their heads and bend their knees. They made us move eastward as far as the forest of Kadurkan, the Kinghan Mountains, and backward, or westward, to the Iron Gates, of Transoxiana. Over all the land between these uttermost points, the Blue Turks held sway as sovereigns. They were wise Kagans, valiant Kagans. All their officers were wise and brave. All their nobles, and the whole people were righteous. 
The moral concepts implied by this famous passage are borrowed from the old cosmogony which formed the basis of Turco-Mongol shamanism. The principles of this cosmogony were very simple, according to the resume by Thompson. The universe consisted of a series of levels, one above the other. The seventeen upper levels formed the heavens, or realm of light, and the seven or nine lower ones constituted the underworld, or place of darkness. Between the two lay the surface of the earth, where men dwelt. Heaven and earth obeyed a supreme being, who inhabited the highest level of the sky, and who was known by the name of divine heaven, or Tangri. Tangri denotes both sky and God. Heaven was also the habitation of virtuous souls, as the subterranean world was the hell of the wicked. Turkic mythology numbered many other deities, one of which was the goddess Omai, the caretaker of children. And no doubt also an earth goddess, personified in the goddess of Mount Otukan and identical with Achigan or Ichigan, goddess of the earth among the Mongols of the 13th century. In addition, countless genies inhabited the earth and the waters, these were the Yursub, or in modern Turkish Yarsu. Notable among the latter were the sprites dwelling in hills and springs, which were considered sacred places, and whose cult would be perpetuated in the practices and laws of the Genghis Khanites. More important still, the Khanate of the Eastern Tuchu, destroyed in 630 by Emperor Taizong, of Tang China, was reconstituted under a descendant of the old royal family, the Kagan Kutluk, the Happy. He is celebrated in the Kosho Tsadam inscription under the name of Elterish Kagan. This inscription, which we owe to Kutluk's son, shows that the restoration of the Turkic Khanate of the Orkhan came in response to a surge of something like national sentiment. The whole commonalty of the Turkic people spoke thus. I was a people with my own empire. Where is my empire now? I was a people with my own Kagan. Where is my Kagan now? Thus did they speak, and in so speaking they became enemies of the Chinese Kagan and began once more to cherish the hope of organizing and establishing themselves as a political state. Then said the Chinese. We will annihilate the Turkic people and cut off their posterity, and they set forth to destroy them. But the God of the Turks in heaven above, and their revered terrestrial and aquatic sprites, did this. That the Turkic people might not be destroyed but might become once more a people, they raised up my father the Kagan Elterish, and my mother the Khatun Bilga, holding them at the summit of heaven. As is borne out by the inscription, the restorer of the Orkhan Empire started as leader of a simple band. My father the Kagan set off with twenty-seven men, then there were seventy. As Tangri gave them strength, my father's army was as wolves and his enemies as ewes. When the number of his men had grown to seven hundred, he dispossessed independent peoples, deposed Khans, reduced men to slavery, governed them according to the laws of our ancestors, and fired their hearts. To the south the Chinese people were our enemies, to the north the Nine Ogas, Tokas Ogas, were our enemies, the Kyrgyz and the Kurikan, the Thirty Tatars and the Kaitai, were enemies. My father the Kagan made forty-seven campaigns and fought twenty battles. As Tangri favored him, he deprived of their empire those who had an empire, and those who had a Kagan he deprived of their Kagan. He pacified his enemies and made them bend the knee and bow the head. Thus, the Khanate of the Eastern Tuchu was restored in its traditional nucleus, by the headwaters of the Orkhan and in the Otukan Mountains, presumably the Kongai Range. The Genghis Khanite Mongols and Tangri The new Genghis Khanite Empire preserved its religious basis. The ancient Turco-Mongol animism, 
mingled to a greater or lesser extent with Mazdean and Chinese elements. The divinity of which the Grand Khan was a manifestation was still Tangri, Heaven or the God of Heaven, similar in some respects to the Chinese Tian, to say nothing of the Iranian Ormuzd. All the descendants of Genghis Khan, who were not either entirely Sinicized in the Far East, or Islamized in Turkestan, Persia, and Russia, were to claim to be the representatives on earth of Tangri. Their commands were his commands, rebellion against them was a rebellion against him. Genghis Khan himself seems to have had a particular devotion to the divinity enthroned on Mount Birkin Khaldun, the Kenti of today, at the source of the Onan. When at the outset of his career he escaped thanks to the swiftness of his horse, from the market, who abducted his wife Borte. It was there that he took refuge. He at once climbed the mountain as a pilgrim. Having first, according to the Mongol custom, removed his cap and thrown his belt over his shoulders in token of submission, he genuflected nine times and made the ritual libation of kumis, the fermented mare's milk that was the alcohol of the nomads. Similarly, later on, before undertaking the great national war against the Qin Empire of Peking, he was to repeat this pilgrimage to Birkin Khaldun and, in the same suppliant attitude, his belt round his neck, to pray. O eternal Tangri, I am armed to avenge the blood of my ancestors, upon whom the kin inflicted an ignominious death. If you approve of what I do, vouchsafe me the aid of your strength. Such is Rashid ad-Din's account of his words. Other sources show him shut up for three days in his tent on the eve of the campaign, alone with the spirit, while around him his people supplicate heaven. Tangri. Tangri. On the fourth day, the Khan strength of heaven emerges at last from his tent, and announces that eternal Tangri has promised him victory. From this ancient animist religion, with its cult of peaks and river sources, came the rites noted by both Muslim writers and Christian missionaries. The ascent of holy mountains to draw near to Tangri and invoke him. The removal of one's cap and the laying of one's belt over the shoulders in token of submission, an obligation which fell upon the Grand Khan himself. The practice of hiding when it thundered, that is to say, when Tangri showed his wrath. The care taken never to defile springs, for they were the haunt of spirits, or to profane streams by washing oneself or one's clothes in them, an act that at first gave rise to serious misunderstandings with Muslim society, which adhered faithfully to its ritual ablutions. In their superstitious awe of heaven and of magical formulas, the Mongols felt it wise to conciliate not only their own shamans but also other possible representatives of the divine. That is to say, leaders of any cult who might conceivably be possessed of supernatural powers, such as Nestorian priests, whom they were to find among the Koreat and Angat. Buddhist monks among the Uyghur and Khitan. Taoist magicians from China. Tibetan lamas, Franciscan missionaries, or Muslim mullahs. Good will shown toward representatives of these various cults provided an additional safeguard to their own Tangri worship, general superstitious dread thus engendered general tolerance. Not until they lost this superstitious timidity did the descendants of Genghis Khan in Turkestan and Persia become intolerant in outlook and behavior.